Madagascar. Located in the Indian Ocean and one of the world's largest islands, it is a land of stories and legends. It's also known as the Red Island because of the color of the earth. You'll be meeting Elise, a botany student. She has a fascination for her country's national tree, the baobab. The arid, hard to get to territory in the south is where she carries out her research. Soloda is a Vezo, a group of nomadic coastal inhabitants. His village on a sandy spit of land jutting into the Mozambique Channel is completely isolated. He spent a few years away from his family, but his love of the sea drew him back. Gilles, a Frenchman, has been here for more than 20 years. An ardent nature lover, he has made his home in the foothills of the island's most beautiful mountains and has decided to reforest the valley where he lives. Jean Giono's book, The Man Who Planted Trees, really impressed me. I'd like these people to remember me as the man who planted trees. Madagascar is a vast territory in the Indian Ocean off the southern coast of Africa. This land of beliefs and mystery, the fifth largest island on Earth, offers a great diversity of landscapes and cultures. A trip to Madagascar is always spiced with adventure. There are very few roads off the central highlands to the northern forests and into the arid plains of the south. Discovering Madagascar means, above all, slowing down, adapting to island time. The National Highway 7 is the only route into the south. Yeah. Elise and Tantel are both botany students doing research. They're off on a long trip to the land of thorns, the vast region in the southernmost part of the island. We cover hundreds, even thousands of kilometers to get there. At least we're doing it in a bush taxi this time. Sometimes we travel by ox cart or even by boat. It's an adventure every time. Elise is doing her doctoral thesis on a tree that is recognizable at a glance, but which in fact is not very well known, the baobab. The Malagasy here call it the renala, meaning mother of the forest. The baobab is the object of many traditional beliefs about mother and child. Its trunk is straight and massive, its bark very smooth, and it has a tender heart. The baobab is the symbol of fertility. The baobab really has an odd look. And in fact, they often say that it was planted upside down, as if its branches were trying to take root in the sky. There's a legend that says, in the final days of creation, the gods realized that they had forgotten to plant the baobabs. So they just tossed them down from the heavens. The two young botanists still have hundreds of kilometers to cover. They are looking for flowering baobabs, for the research is focused on the reproductive cycle of a particular species found only in the southern part of the island. Toliara the major city of southern Madagascar. Elise and Tantel still have a ways to go. They left the capital two days ago and have crossed half the vast island with a single goal in mind, to find a baobab that is just about to flower. 
We think there's a sort of hybridization going on in the baobabs. So I'm going to try and find out just how this hybridization works. Of the world's eight known species of baobabs, this large island is home to seven, and six of those are endemic to the island. Some of them are hybrids, and Elysee is seeking to solve this enigma. After the bush taxi, they continue their trip south with a zebu cart into the Mahafali Plateau, a poor, arid region. Here we go, just what we need. The mystery surrounding the baobab is the mystery of the reproduction of all living beings, of the fragile balance of nature the life cycle of flowers, pollen, and insects. The baobab flower, an ephemeral bloom, resembles a wild orchid. It only blossoms once in the tree's lifetime for a few days, and only during the hot summer nights. Ser and Dilf, two climbers specialized in trees, will be helping Elysee carry out her observations. Now it's Elysee's turn to tackle the baobab. She has spotted flower buds that might bloom at nightfall about 15 meters up in the tree. The very first time I climbed a baobab, I felt right away that I was in my element. I was at home in the tree. I felt good climbing. I really felt good with everything having to do with the life of the baobab. And maybe I feel I was destined to study them after such an experience. Look, the cord and the knots have to be taught all the time. And as you go up, this is how you feed yourself slack, okay? Elise, acrobat and botanist, now has to get familiar with her treetop laboratory. She's hoping to observe the flower blooming when evening comes and to spy on some insects she suspects of being the pollinators of these majestic trees. This parched land covered by thorny savanna and shadeless forest is the land of the Sakalavs, an ethnic group whose character has been forged by their harsh environment. Twice a day, Dimbriza and his family have to come into this forest, home to many lemurs. Dimbriza comes to collect nature's gift. This is his only riches, a baobab that he has transformed into a water reservoir, a baobab cistern. We're used to managing our water from day to day. 
The baobab is the cornerstone of our life, but its wood is useless. You can't do anything with it. We don't eat much meat. We're not allowed to kill the zebu. We don't grow manioc. All we have, in fact, is the baobab. It's my life. It's a mother to me. <laughs> Dimbriza has hollowed out the tree trunk down to a height of 1 meter 50. This doesn't harm the tree and allows it to continue growing. After each rain, Dimbriza's family collects the rainwater from the ground and stores it in the baobab, a necessary reservoir to make it through the severe shortages of the dry season. <laughs> Here, more than anywhere else, water is scarce, and so even more precious. On the Mahafali Plateau, finding water is a constant worry. The water from the Baobab cistern meets the normal needs of the whole family. This baobab takes the place of the zebu. It takes the place of a cart of the goats that I don't have. It's my only treasure. That's why I take such good care of it. If the baobab dies well, I disappear and my family along with me. For three days now, the little crew of scientists and climbers have been camping in the bush at the foot of the trees. At first, the villagers were surprised by their setup, but now they've become a regular local attraction. One has to admit they are an intriguing sight. Every evening, the group from Tananarivo attracts more locals, curious to learn more about these strange experiments being carried out at nightfall. For a long time now, scientists thought that the only pollinators of the baobab were lemurs and bats. Only recently have botanists discovered the vital role played by a certain insect, the sphinx moth. The sphinx moth is probably one of the insects that pollinate the baobab. We recently discovered that it is maybe the tree's main pollinator. Since it is a moth, it can easily carry pollen from one flower to another. Élisée, Dilf and Serre are getting ready to spend the night suspended between sky and earth. Up in the baobab, everything has been readied to observe the blossoming of the flowers. Now it's up to nature to play her role. Je te laisse rentrer, passer dans la fourse d'abord, parce qu'on ne pourra pas entrer nous deux direct. D'accord. It's really a whole expedition just getting to the tree at exactly the right time. But maybe that's exactly why I like this work. 
This phenomenon is very hard to observe. You have to work at it. And maybe that's what I find important in what I'm doing. There's like a shudder of nature, a stirring, sign of its amazing vigor. And in a few minutes, the flower transforms and opens to the world. This is a magical and fleeting moment. Madagascar is known for its very rich biodiversity. So if the baobab were ever to disappear, we'd lose a treasure. We'd lose our culture as well, and our identity, because the baobab is Madagascar. Elise's research has just begun. She wants to learn all she can about the baobabs in order to protect them. No one knows how to tell the age of a baobab. These imposing giants of nature must surely be over a thousand years old. Testimony to the island's rich biodiversity, the baobabs have centuries of Madagascar's ecological history engraved in their flesh. Sarodrano, the end of the world. Living here means adapting to extreme isolation. In Malagasy, Sarodrano has two meanings, difficult waters and land surrounded by water. It is, in fact, both. We're in a village of the Vezo, Madagascar's great seafaring people the nomads of the sea. The Vezo live all along the southwest coast of Madagascar, a region parched by the heat and regularly lashed by cyclones. Right from its early settlement, Sarodrano has turned its back away from the land and towards the sea. The village is located on a spit of sand that juts out into the Mozambique Channel. So the best way to get there is on foot or by the sea, which can sometimes be risky. The fishermen's outriggers are practically the only craft that dare venture across the coral reefs that ring the lagoon. Coming into this village is like landing on an island. Soloda is a native son of Sarodrano, native son of the wind and sea. The village has its daily routine. Every morning and evening during the cooler hours of the day, they go to fetch water. Our village is called Saradrana because before there was no water here. They had to go buy it in the neighboring villages. And that's what they had to do back in the olden days. Here, we have enough to eat. We raise a few animals, and the water we need is not all that far away. Mm -hmm. 
The Vezo live in a quiet backwater away from the bustling world. Nature is the only thing that shapes their existence. In spite of the rudimentary conditions, Solada is quite attached to his remote region. A few years ago, Solada decided to come back to live where he was born. Before that, he had to leave his village in order to help out his family. He joined the Malagasy army. But the strict military life is a far cry from how these free men live. After years in uniform, he became a merchant, traveling the country to buy and sell rice. Again, not the ideal situation for him. So Soloda came back to Sarodrano to start a family. This is Soloda's family clan, three generations living in peace and harmony. Even though they are gradually becoming more sedentary, the Vezo have remained nomads at heart, as Soloda's father, the patriarch of the family, has always been. It wasn't mere chance that brought us here. It's the will of the Creator that led us to this land. Before we were truly nomads, when there were no fish, we'd travel a long ways to find them. We'd settle in other fishing villages. The sea always wins in the end. She is mighty. We, men, we come and go, but the sea, she never dies. <laughs> In the Vezo tradition, there is a single god of the sea. He is all-powerful over the environment. He protects all those who travel on the water. The cliffs that dominate the village are a sacred site, the final resting place of the souls of the ancestors. For the Vezo, the spirits are everywhere. They hover over the sea and ensure the happiness of the living. But apart from their beliefs, the only thing that the fishermen have to face the elements is their long experience of the sea. When there's a shipwreck, well, the whole village heads out in the boats to help. The carpenter is a very important person in the village. The fishermen come from all the neighboring villages to have their boats repaired. Boats come in every day here for repairs. The lakas, the Vezo outrigger canoes, are surely identical to those used by their ancestors when they migrated here from Asia. The techniques used for constructing the lakas are a distillation of all these fishermen's sailing scents, the end product of an intuitive knowledge of the sea. The boat is the heart of the Vezu people. A Vezu without his canoe is simply not a Vezu. He's just a vagabond. We use it to travel, to hunt octopus, to earn our living. The canoe is to the Vezo what the car is to foreigners. elegant gesture of the Vezo. 
In Malagasy, Vezo means simply one who paddles. They claim they are not an ethnic group or tribe. Being Vezo is a culture, a state of mind. It's a way of living from day to day, to the rhythm of the tides and the passing seasons. The sea is the only means of subsistence for these mariners of southern Madagascar. Parents teach their children to sail very young, whenever they have spare time. This is the heritage that gets passed on. When children know what they're doing, they're put out to sea alone in the boat. Me too. I'll teach my children everything I know about the sea. Because the sea is the Vezo's Bible. Solida has been fishing since he was six. To scare the fish and drive them into the nets, it's always the same age-old technique. When I come back to the village at noon, I decide then whether I'll go out again in the afternoon. It all depends on the morning's catch. If it's still no good in the afternoon, I'll go out again at night for shrimp. And that's what goes on in a fisherman's head. Sailing fishing, living on the water. In the end, Solida yielded to the call of his destiny. The Vezo don't do any farming. They don't raise cattle. They live from and for the sea. It's their most precious possession. They never work the land, but why not farm the sea? With funding from an NGO, Solida and some other fishermen have set up a seaweed farm. They're hoping to sell their crop abroad to the cosmetics and food industries. When the plants are young, you have to take very special care of them every day. Check that there are no dead or broken branches. Because if you don't take care of them, the seaweed could die. And then if you get bad weather, they could be damaged from floating debris. We don't have television to check the weather forecast. Sometimes we listen to the radio when we can. Otherwise, we watch the wind and listen to the sea. This is the very beginning of an experiment that could mark a turning point in these people's lives. The seaweed shoots aren't mature yet, but if the project is a success, it will ensure them a steady source of income. There's nothing here. It's untouched land. And we love it. We feel at home here. And the sea is full of food. The Vezo are attached to this place. We're not allowed to sell it. It's our heritage for future generations, so that they too can benefit from this spot. We feel good here. It warms our heart. There are a lot of people in the village, and we're happy. The Vezo are a free people, a tightly knit group that help each other out. If nature doesn't have any nasty tricks in store for them, Solada and the fishermen of Sarodrano may very well make a success of their project to farm the sea, their source of life, their sole riches.
high lands in the center of Madagascar is a region where life follows the rhythm of the rice harvests. This plant, originally from Asia, is the staple food and part of the common heritage of all the Malagasy. It's the symbol of life. Rice and rice paddies also have a sacred significance for many Malagasy. At the frontier of the central highlands is another region, a mountainous land inhabited by spirits, a land of peasants marked by the marriage of sky and granite. The Tsaranoro Valley is not all that far from civilization, yet it has long remained cut off, as if the world had forgotten this land where the mountains reach up into the skies. left his home in Marseille when he was 20, crossed Africa on foot, and lived in the Comoros Islands. Then in the late 1980s, he discovered Madagascar and at Saranoro, this quiet valley isolated from the rest of the world. When we first came, we needed the four-wheel drive to get to the nearest large village, which is 10 kilometers away from the paved road. Then we had to continue on foot. There was no trail anymore. It was abandoned about 50 years back. There weren't even any ox carts in the valley. People only got around on foot, and the same went for us. I spent a good part of my life in the mountains. I grew up in Briançon in the high Alps in France, and I love the mountains. I've done a lot of cross-country skiing, climbing, kayak, some delta plane. When I landed here, it was completely virgin territory. I think any climber would find this a paradise. For Gilles, the Saranoro Valley was a revelation. He literally fell in love with this spot. And ever since, this nature lover has been covering the length and breadth of the valley to satisfy his yearning for nature. The valley is home to many herds of zebu, the peasants' only riches. But these animals are often the booty of human predators, the dahals, zebu thieves who strike at night. 800,000 head of cattle are stolen every year. It's a serious problem for Malagasy cattle herders. Originally, it stems from a tradition. If you were a man and you wanted a wife, you had to steal a zebu at least once in your life. Now it's gotten out of hand. I don't know if it's a mafia, but there's a feeling of insecurity in the rural area. It's emptying the countryside. It's become depopulated because of this fear of rural banditry. It has nothing to do with tradition anymore. Every night there are children from the valley who come sleep up here. They call them the eyes of the mountains. They keep an eye on the herds. Following in Gilles' footsteps, we discover the valley, its history, and its scars. Wow, it's close, celui-là. This is a lavac, an open gash caused by erosion. Mountain runoff that has been channeled to irrigate the rice paddies in the valleys gouges deep ravines in the earth. These gaping wounds scarring these bald hills are the grim consequence of deforestation. Nature is generous in Madagascar, but if we throw things too far out of balance, there will be negative consequences. Nature has her own defense mechanisms, but this is too much for her to handle. There's digging, erosion, and it's hard to undo. Phenomena like this are hard to control.
Today, Gilles and his hiking buddy Noah are getting ready to climb a cliff face overlooking the valley. The highest cliff here is 800 meters, and it's a notorious challenge to extreme rock climbers. This imposing granite wall is still unconquered. Not even the world's best climbers have managed to climb it in one go. Gilles and Noah don't take themselves for champion climbers. They opened and equipped a much easier climbing route. There's the physical pleasure. Climbing can be very physical. There's the pleasure of the gymnastics and the movements on the rock. Then there's the idea of pushing yourself. The little athletic challenge. Can I do it? Yes, I can. No, I can't. It's really, really something. It's such a privilege. You look out on the valley and you're the only one out there. So peaceful. You're so far removed from civilization. You won't see a single telephone pole, a single road. Maybe two or three cattle herders, but you're really alone in the mountains. You can come and go as you please, and there's absolutely no one you have to answer to. I could have settled down anywhere, but this valley was love at first sight. There's no rational explanation. Some places on earth, you just feel wow. You get this vibration. It really hit me here. I said to myself, that's it. I found my paradise. I'd wandered a lot, and here I thought, really, this is perfect. This is pure bliss. When you look around 360 degrees, it's really breathtaking. You have all the mountains from the Andringitra to the Bobby Peak, which is the country's second highest summit. There's the Tsaranaro behind us, an incredible sheer cliff 800 meters high. It's really a spectacular landscape. One of a kind. It's unique. The Tsaranoro Rodeo, a rice paddy bullfight. Trampling the rice paddies, it's a tradition and the teenagers just love it. It takes courage and daring to play this risky game. It's meant to prepare the rice fields for planting by churning them up into muddy wallows. You can never tell when an accident might happen. If something goes wrong, we just have to tough it out. Accidents happen with the zebu mainly when you don't follow the advice of the adults. They tell us to watch out and to always be alert. This valley used to be nearly all covered with forest. Slash and burn farming has had devastating results throughout the vast island. 
But out in the countryside, there's no other solution but to burn off the brush to regenerate the soil. Today is Madagascar's National School Day, a special day for school children. The pupils of Emile, the valley's school teacher, are going to plant trees today. It's not merely a symbolic act, it's a concrete gesture in favor of the environment. To get the seedlings, they head for Gilles' nursery. This Frenchman has been doggedly replanting the valley. For him, it's a way to connect with the villagers and the mountains where he has chosen to live. <laughs> Gilles' nursery is open to all the local inhabitants. Every year, Gilles plants over 100,000 seedlings. We simply work with the kids. The adults won't change. It's too late. So every year at the same time, the children come and plant trees. When they're grown up, when the rains come, they'll continue to plant on their plots of land and little by little, get the forest back into shape. Throughout the island, school children devote two days a year to their natural environment. The school in the valley is a green school, sensitive to questions of agriculture and ecology. The school program is designed to stem the rural exodus. The whole philosophy is directed at getting the school children to consider making a life for themselves right here in the valley. And this is Gilles' goal as well. To that end, he has founded an association to reforest and protect the Saranoro Valley. A forest doesn't sprout up overnight. Gilles has set up a nursery of eucalyptus, a rapid growth tree that will meet the villagers' needs in wood. Year by year, Gilles' work is bearing fruit. This is the new forest of Volomaka, the little village back there. The villagers did that. We planted 3,000 trees on a few acres of land. These saplings were planted 12, 13 months ago. And now, in a few years, the villagers will be able to use the wood. Like that older stand of trees we planted 12 years ago. If we hope to reforest the mountains, the people have to be able to meet their needs in wood. We can't demand that they stop cutting wood just because cutting wood is bad. We must replace the wood they're not allowed to cut. I think I was meant to live here on this land. Deep down, I believe I was destined to live here. Not just here in Madagascar, but here in this valley. These wide open spaces, this virgin wilderness have a certain grandeur. Here you sometimes find yourself very, very far from the modern world. That's what wide open spaces mean to me. Not just some kind of a well-manicured park. Just the opposite, a vast territory, terribly empty. When you come right down to it, the population is very sparse on this land. I mean on the island of Madagascar. 
You realize that you can live with very little here. And you meet people who, whatever may happen to them, they're always ready to laugh from morning to night. They have nothing, a clump of straw, a little machete, but they're happy. Operation Tree Planting. At dawn, Gilles heads up the hill. It's the rainy season, time to plant. Over the years, Gilles has formed a crew of planters, a group of villagers won over to his cause. They plant young seedlings and also use Gilles' own particular technique. These balls are seeds coated in a mixture of dirt and zebu dung. The results are kind of haphazard. 15 to 20 percent of the seeds take root, but that's not the most important thing. These hills are extremely bare. They've been ravaged. Even planting a tree, a little seed, is already something. My little association can't reforest the whole valley, all of Madagascar, the whole planet. We're trying to set an example. Look, we're planning. Just wait two or three years and you'll reap the benefits. There are trees that are beginning to bear fruit. So there are concrete results. On the road we replanted, when it's hot, people walk under the new trees. They stop and rest in the shade. They're starting to see the positive results. Erosion is starting to diminish. So we hope that by showing the people what action to take and what it can bring to their land, it will convince them to reverse the tendency, which is still to clear the trees to make pasture land. This is a kind of special place, Candelosa. It used to be a royal palace, and there's a funny story about it. The king was cruel with his subjects, so the subjects reacted towards him like one does with an abusive king. Well, they didn't decapitate him because it's taboo to draw royal blood here in Madagascar. They suffocated him. They suffocated him with bananas. Every time I come up here, I get a kind of weird feeling. It's my Malagasy side coming out. I'm starting to be influenced by the irrational local beliefs. You can't live here without assimilating a bit of the mysticism, the magic. You just can't. It's an integral part of life in Madagascar. It's not easy. It takes two hours to hike up, so there's no way to bring water here. We have to give the trees the best conditions to start with, and then we wait and see. In a few decades, the children of Saranora will be able to look out on their valley that's green year-round, and, as Gilles hopes, covered with forest. They will remember that their ancestors once crossed paths with an eccentric Frenchman who loved trees. 
Jean Giono's book, The Man Who Planted Trees, really impressed me. The story of a shepherd who planted thousands of trees and reconstituted a whole forest. Even the authorities were surprised. What's this? A new forest? That left its mark on me. I'd like these people to remember me as the man who planted trees.